Good afternoon. Let's take you through this web. So I'm Merv Wyeth and I'm secretary to APM Benefits Management Specific Interest Group. Uh, welcome to this webinar. It's brought to you by ourselves on the Benefits Management SIG and also with the assistance of the guys from the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, the IPA. Today's presentation represents the culmination of APM Strengthening Your Knowledge November campaign for effective benefits management. If you're among the 350 plus attendees at our webinar three weeks ago, you'd have learned about the newly launched Guide to Achieving Benefits Management in Major Projects. We ran three polls that day and the write-up, the presentation, the recording and the Q&A uh, are now available on the APM site. Today, colleagues from the IPA are going to tell us about two more initiatives to professionalise the project delivery function. And project delivery is one of 11 functions of government. And this is not just about major projects, it's relevant to the entire civil service, all public projects, and ultimately you and I, citizens who demand taxpayer value from projects and programs undertaken on our behalf. This week, the NAO published a report on how the IPA will support Brexit. And you can see an item about that on the news and opinion section, again on the APM site. The briefing describes how the IPA is supporting departments as they initiate and deliver projects to implement uh, exi uh, exiting from the EU. And there's some key facts early on in their report, uh, including the fact that 10 of the 138 existing projects in the GMPP uh, have been assessed as being affected by the EU exit. Um, there's a lot of reviewing activity going on and the, uh, the authority estimates that in the next uh, year or so, between 250 and 300 project and program managers are going to need to be recruited. So this is, uh, this is very timely. The webinar is scheduled to last no more than an hour, and it is going to be interactive. So if you haven't already done so, I want you to start by asking you to complete a short survey. And here I cue the software called Mentimeter. Um, and what I need you to do is to log into menti.com and enter the code. And the information there is at the top of the screen. The code is 725378. And I can see that some of you have already done so, so thank you for that. Um, the survey is actually configured to run at audience pace. So you can take your time or you can zip ahead. It's really up to you. And there's a mix of closed questions uh, and several where we're looking for short textual answers, which will create beautiful word clouds. The questions have a character, these questions have a character count of 25, so you'll need to be brief. Afterwards, you'll be able to download the results for yourself and we'll publish them too. So uh, let's have a, a quick look at the survey. Uh, first of all, we're interested in what age group are you, are you in? And, uh, and this profile being to change, we can see that 49 of you have voted. And just so you know, there's uh, just over 180 um, people that are attending this webinar. There could be more as people watch uh, elsewhere. So, uh, so thank you for your information on that. Uh, I see we've got a very low number, 24 years or less. Are you a member of APM and at what level? Um, and um, clearly uh, quite a lot of you are, will not, uh, maybe not yet be members, um, but that will give us a good idea of um, who's on this webinar. So thank you for that. Uh, and we've got 2% fellows, so um, that sounds like me and someone else at the moment. Um, do you or have you worked in the UK public sector? And here are the three options. Yes, as a civil, uh, civil servant or a public servant, or a contractor, or, or no. And we can see there's quite a high proportion there um, that have in some shape or form worked in um, public service. Uh, what type of project-related role do you typically perform? Um, a whole range here, um, quite a, a quarter of you uh, in that leadership, um, senior directing role of projects, um, lots of project delivery specialists, and then where benefits sits in business analysis, change specialists, we can say 8%, so a good number. Um, and here we've got a, um, a beautiful word cloud of the various roles that you've entered. We can take a look at that a little bit later, but um, there's no um, doubting uh, what the key role is here. Does your organization use a project management competence framework? Um, there's a APM competence framework, and we're gonna to learn today about the project delivery capability framework, but clearly um, you may use others, and we've got quite a lot of you who are not yet using a framework. 
Uh, were you aware of the project delivery capability framework? That's very promising. Um, I suspect one or two of you may have seen it as a result of publicity about today, but um, wherever you've seen it, we're glad that you have. Um, project management related qualifications, we can take a little look at that later. Um, but uh, that's really interesting. Print to MSP, we expect, but um, a good number of you have taken the uh, APM APMP. What activities you do to undertake for your professional development? As I say, we'll be able to look through these and uh, and and share what they are. But uh, thank you for those answers. Um, the government uh, Gov PDC. I'll tell you a little bit about that later on. Um, but we can see that uh, again, uh, just 20% members at the moment, but quite a lot of interest already. So thanks for completing the survey. If you haven't already done so, then um, please uh, fill that in. As I say, it's uh, it's at your own rate as the audience. So uh, let's uh, introduce our two speakers for today. So first of all, uh, Tony Sigel. Um, Tony's currently the capability consultant with the IPA. Uh, previously worked in the oil and gas industry for over 30 years, mostly at BG Group, uh, and there he held senior roles in, within operations, projects, uh, technology and commercial, and spent over 15 years working internationally. Tony's been a talent and capability consultant since two, 2012 and worked for Royal Mail, OMV, which is Austria's largest company, and is now working with the Cabinet Office in IPA uh, to deliver the project delivery capability framework. Uh, Tony's joined by Mark Sutherland, and Mark is a career silver servant with over 20 years in central government, working in a range of project and program roles. Over the years, Mark has worked in a range of projects and programs in the HR, IT, and estates areas. He was part of a team that developed and introduced the project program governance arrangements within the Department for Work and Pensions, and for three years was the secretary to DWP's main governance and assurance board. In his current role at the IPA, he's been working uh, with Tony on the development of the uh, PDCF and also on the government online skills tool, also known as GHOST. So uh, welcome to our two speakers. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mer, for the great introduction and, and really enjoyed the survey. It gives us a great feel for, for who's online and, and who we're talking to. Um, so I, I was responsible for, for leading the development of the project delivery capability framework um, and it took about 18 months in, in total. Um, we finished it in May and, and put it in, in line on May. Uh, and I'm going to take you through the, the framework itself. But before I do that, I just realised that quite a lot of people online uh, aren't uh, government employees. So I want to give a bit of context about why we did this and the, the importance of it. I'm going to talk a little bit about our starting point, where we came from, and a little bit about how we went about it, and then I'll actually go through the framework itself. So starting with the context, why did we do this? Uh, government employees deliver some of the largest and most complex projects you'll find anywhere in the world. Uh, our CEO, Tony Meggs, who came in from uh, BP, he was uh, head of projects in BP, thought you know he knew everything about projects before he came into government but soon realized that uh, uh, some of the projects that he ran within BP pale, well, not into insignificance, but you know, considerably less complex than many government projects that, uh, that, that people across government are engaged in. The government major projects portfolio, known as the GMPP, has a whole life cost of 455 billion pounds of taxpayers' money. And that just consists of 143 projects, which is across 17 different departments. And broadly, that is split between transformational type projects, ICT, infrastructure, and, and military. Uh, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. These are just the, the, the com high, complex, contentious, uh, uh, and unique projects. There are a whole raft of other projects, and the total spend is actually in the trillions. The civil service alone consists of just over 400,000 people, of which around 11,000 people are engaged day in, day out in activity of delivering projects. Uh, if we consider the arm length bodies outside of the core civil service, then we are talking about many, many more people. And if we include the NHS as well, then we're probably talking about 30 or 40,000 people 
across all government departments and ALBs engaged in project activity. So building government capability to initiate and deliver projects is very, very important indeed. So our starting point came in 2015 and Mercer came in and they were engaged through some benchmarking activity across uh, our major departments and uh, across uh, project delivery roles. Uh, they quickly realized that it actually wasn't possible to do the benchmarking and the feedback we got from them was that there was there is no structure. When they looked across the eight largest government departments, they found there were 360 different job titles. And even when they found job titles that match, the roles of the job descriptions were very different. So it's very hard. There was no consistency internally, let alone anything that could be benchmarked uh, robustly externally as well. So most departments had tried to use, uh, put a competency system in place for their project professionals. Uh, all of them uh, plumbed for the APM competencies, the old 47 or the new 27, uh, but only two departments when I got here uh, in uh, December uh, 2015 had anything remaining in place. All others had either stalled or, or failed. Um, and there were some common capability issues. Before we started this project, we wanted to find out what the issues were. And the main issues were around planning or lack of planning. Benefits management was another one that wasn't managed well. And risks and issue management also was, was another uh, big issue which came up time and time again through kind of assurance reviews of major projects. So um, we had no idea how many people were involved in project delivery activity at that time. But on the positive side, there was a curriculum in place, but the approach to it was a, was a bit random. Um, and the really positive thing is that a few years back, it's been running for five years now, we have some very good, strong leadership programs in place for project professionals. The major projects leadership academy run at Oxford Said, and the project leadership program, which is run at Cranfield. And over the last five years, we've cycled, or we have on those courses, around about a thousand project leaders that have been through those programs. And that is, that is the saviour in a way. If we hadn't done those things, we wouldn't be in the place we are now. Um, and we had a reasonable insurance uh, system in place as well. So they were the kind of positives. So how do we go about developing this capability framework? Initially when I came here, I spoke to lots of different people in different departments. And uh, a, a guy called Ian Merriman in, in the MOD said something to me which really resonated and became the quote which we used for the whole project. And he said, we don't want to be civil servants working on a project. We want to be project professionals working in the civil service. Now that is a very deep, very fundamental part of what we're doing in developing a profession across government. And being a professional means that you're not just working on an individual contributor on a, on a project, <clears throat> but you feel part of something bigger you have a potential for a career, you have laid out development, and you are valued across the organization for what you do. And that's, if we can get to that point where people feel like professionals, rather than civil servants working on a project, then we know we're actually starting to, to deliver what we aimed and set out to do. Um, we didn't want to adapt something from elsewhere. Early on in this process, a very senior person in the civil service said to me, can't we just pick something from somewhere else? You've got lots of experience with this and just use that. We could have done, but it wouldn't have been a great fit, and it also wouldn't have had the buy-in from the, the different departments. And the important thing for sustainability was that everybody working on one thing in the same way. Um, in, we, we worked with, or I worked with an individual from each of the main government departments who was the representing uh, body of that department to develop this. But in total, we had over a hundred projects Project professionals that worked on this and this truly is something that has been developed by government project professionals for government project professionals okay so I'm going to get into the kind of presentation now hope hopefully you can see it on the screen uh, if you download this when you see the mouse moving across here it's actually an interactive PDF it looks like a PowerPoint presentation and you can use the arrow key here and just go through slide by slide but uh, it's quite a long document, it's 250 odd pages. 
Um, but it feels like a very light document because no information is more than three clicks away. Um, the three key elements to the capability framework are the career pathways, which is essentially all the roles that exist, different levels, and helps people navigate a, a, a career. The second part is all the competencies, and these are all the skills and competencies that people need, uh, which are profiled against all those roles and at the different levels of those roles. And the final bit, which is development, are all the professional development programs, courses, uh, but also not just those, it's the 70 and 20 as well. It's the kind of on the job, near the job learning, as, as well as the um, uh, uh, courses and programs as well. So all the development that people can do to manage a career within project delivery. And on the right hand side here, uh, we have like, what is the PDCF? Who's it for? How do I access it? When should I do it? It's all written, in, you know, we took a lot of time getting the language right, so it's very accessible uh, for people in government and, and also outside. Again, you'll see here the career pathways, the competencies, the development, uh, uh, these little symbols and colours as well. All of this follows through into the online skills tool, which Mark will, will show you later. The really good thing about this as well is that there's a little back button. And uh, sometimes I think in these interactive tools, it's very easy to end down uh, go down a warren and not being able to get back from where you are, but here you can always get back to the last page. So you should never get lost in the tool itself. Now, each of the three elements has a landing page, which looks very similar to the front page. It's all got our very nice new branding on it as well. So it's nice and vibrant and exciting. And again, we'll start with the career pathways on the right hand side here. You can look what is a career pathway, who's it for, when should I do it, et cetera, et cetera. So a good explanation of what it is. And on the left-hand side are the kind of key elements within the career pathways. The first one, which I'm gonna show you very quickly, are the career pathways. And we are starting to build up a gallery of some of our key people that are long-term people in project delivery. And this is really to bring it to life, to show people that people have different careers, that come from different backgrounds, uh, Fiona Spencer is our, our head of profession within um, the Home Office uh, and if you look at her background, this is her journey along the bottom here, uh, she had a, a, her qualifications a PhD in French, so you know we are a very kind of uh, fluid kind of profession, people come from lots of uh, different backgrounds who end up in project delivery and Fiona Spencer now is the Chief Portfolio Officer in, in the Home Office. And she's given also a bit about uh, her own personal development journey and career advice uh, as well. So I think people can uh, find this, hopefully that it makes it more accessible for people. Now that the key element here is the career pathways overview itself. And then you remember I said earlier, we had 360 different job titles. Well, we worked very hard to get these down to some standard roles. And we've ended up with 19 standard roles uh, across government. Um, they are generally uh, in three uh, job families here. Uh, the leadership ones, which you would expect to see, which are portfolio, program, projects, and PMO. But we've also, for completeness, included head of profession. And then this one here, the SRO stroke sponsor. Now, SROs are very seldom full-time, uh, SRO's senior responsible owner very seldom a full-time role within project delivery. Um, but they are very accountable. They're accountable for on the GMPB projects to the Public Accounts Committee. So it was very important that somebody took care of the development of those people in those roles. And we felt we were best placed to do that. And that's why all of our heads of profession absolutely saw the SRO sponsor role being part of our career pathway. Um, the other 13 roles are generally what we call specialist roles. And uh, they are the, the, the ones that we call the project delivery specialists are the ones that you would generally find within a project or PMO office. So it's things like project planner, benefits manager, risk and issue manager, etc. Uh, the two at the bottom here are the business change manager and business analyst. These are ones that you generally find within the business. And I'm gonna correct myself here because the benefits manager and stakeholder manager are two which are on the cusp. Sometimes you find those within the project office, sometimes you find those within the business, depending on your local government, size of project setup, etc. 
Now, there are two ways of looking at these roles and, and, and drilling down. Uh, you can either go to the role itself. In this case, uh, as we've got Merv on the phone, I'm going to go to Benefits Manager. And there is a very simple description of what a Benefits Manager does. It literally is a couple of sentences long. As I say, all of this is written by project professionals within within government checked by other project professionals and we worked hard to get the language down to be as simple and as accessible as possible so anyone coming from outside of our profession could also look at this role and within uh, reading that couple of sentences would very easily understand what the role of benefits manager was we then looked at the grades at which this role exists and these, this is the civil service grades we're using EO to G6 and we came up with a very anodyne labelling of this role. Uh, so we've got Benefits Manager 1 for the lowest role through to Benefits Manager 5, which is the most senior role. Now, there's a good reason for doing this. We didn't want to change everybody's job titles. Often, their job titles mean something in their local environment or within their department. And it's quite an emotive thing changing people's job titles. But people should be able to relate themselves to a column on the uh, career pathways. So uh, the benefits manager two might be uh, called uh, just benefits manager in the home office. It might in MOD be called junior benefits manager. It doesn't really matter that their titles are different locally as long as they can align to the capability framework. And then against uh, each role, we've put the different types of responsibilities that people could have. And we've described at the different levels the, uh, what somebody would be doing against those uh, typical responsibilities. This goes on to a second page as well. And we've also got something called entry criteria. Now we've shown a different criteria for those who are coming for a project delivery route and those who are coming for a non-project delivery route. And this is generally saying, is this a suitable entry point for somebody to come into uh, the profession? And for a non-project professional, yes, at uh, these first two levels, it, it is uh, uh, an entry-level position. Uh, the next level, it will be suitable for someone who had some experience. And then at the, the, the higher levels, it's not really uh, usually suitable for somebody to come in. And it just gives an idea for people about uh, who are moving across different functions and uh, professions within the civil service and across government, uh, where, where their kind of touch points are and where they can. Now, if I go back, the career pathways, the other way of entering and looking at a role is against these dots, which are against each of the grades. So if I go to SEO uh, uh, Benefits Manager, and click on this dot, this now is that whole column slightly expanded. So it's the same role description, the typical responsibilities, the entry route. But now if I come to the second page, it will also bring out the competencies and the qualifications which are typical for this role at this level. <clears throat> now I will come on to the competencies in, in, in a minute, but we have 19 technical and 10 behavioral competencies. Uh, and then the qualifications, again, we agreed uh, these across all government departments. It was done together. It, it actually didn't take a lot of work. Over two meetings, we managed to look at all the qualifications and come to a complete agreement about which level that uh, typically people should be doing uh, these different types of qualifications against roles and grade. Um, none of this, must say, by the way, is uh, cast in stone. So we're not saying because you are a benefits manager at this grade, you must do these courses. We are signposting this stuff for people. And through the tool mark, we'll show you later, People can put in all the courses and programs they've done, put in all their skills, and it will show them their strengths and weaknesses, and it will, give, it will show them and, and signpost them towards courses and programs and other development to think about. So I'm going to come back to the Career Pathways page, and I'm going to say, Merv, are there any questions we've received at this point around the Career Pathways? Uh, yeah, we've got three come in, but I'll just deal with one here and pick up on the other, which is... Um Recognising the PDCF was uh, developed by UK government, to what extent can it be used or applied by private companies not engaged on UK government work? Well, that's a good question. And it's interesting, since we um, put this out, and we put it on gov.uk, so it's completely accessible by anyone, and we've had quite a lot of interest from external organisations. 
and uh, a few people have contacted us and they've wanted to either use it or use substantial parts of it in the development of their own frameworks and we are completely open to that so you know we've developed it for government but anybody that can make use of it please go ahead and uh, if it helps you uh, you know we'd we'd like to have a, a little credit to say where it came from but uh, it's it's completely available and open to anybody uh, i would say probably crack on and we've got a few more questions for later tony okay all right so i'm going to go into the competencies now now uh later on mark will come back to this page and there is a link there to the online skills tool and uh, that's how mark will enter the, the, the tool um so again you can see uh, you know what our competencies who are they for on the right hand side here and on the left hand side we've got the technical and the leadership competencies the standard levels for evaluation and we've also got a link back to the APM competencies now we looked at several um, competency sets when we developed this and we found that the APM was the one that people in government were most used to so we didn't want to change things for the sake of changing them and so we, we started with the APM as our kind of uh, starting point and of the APM 27 competencies we we found that 22 of those were technically focused and five of those were kind of behavioral leadership focused so when we took the technical competencies we went through them one by one as a group and we said is this a competency we need is it a competency that can be combined with another competence uh, is it one we don't need and is there anything else we should be adding and again when we went through uh, we looked at the titles and so things like integrated planning didn't really mean very much within uh, civil service terms so that one from the uh, api we just call planning um, and so there are subtle changes to the titles um, uh, but the descriptions themselves again i think a lot of people found uh, that and, and the thing that tends to kill competency systems is that they become too complex take people too long to complete um, and the language isn't written in a language which means something within their organization and the APM have written this for a much broader church of people so I think it's a fantastic starting point but ideally it does need to be uh, uh, tailored for your own organization and when we originally did this we started to write and uh, I'll click on a couple of slides here these these are our kind of levels we have four competency levels from awareness to expert and again, these are levels that people were used to within the uh, uh, within government. So again, we didn't want to change those titles. Um, but what we have worked on is the actual description of those competency levels. And people have got a very basic description, so basic knowledge and limited or no experience, and then a bit more detail of those indicators underneath. But this stays the same for every competence. When we originally started writing this, we did write different descriptions at each of those different levels for each competence but then we challenged ourselves and said do we need to do that could we make it more more simple at the end of the day we're only asking people to put a check in a box against the competence have we got enough there for them to understand what that competence is so we challenged ourselves to keep, keep making this and keep it as simple as possible so when we come back to the um, technical competencies you can see they are literally a sentence or two each and we spent a lot of time uh, looking at the words, honing those, making sure that they were understood by people across government and in, in all government departments. And we trialled it in many government departments. We got a lot of feedback, made some slight changes to it, but we found that this wording tends to work. And we were getting kind of nine out of 10 uh, responses from, from people about the, their level of understanding. And it also makes it very quick for people to complete their competencies and when we trialled this we were getting people completing their actual competencies not their all their development piece but within about 20 minutes and previous experience has been with, with other competency systems used in government that it can take typically three hours for people to complete as we move on to the behavioral leadership competencies and, and it was really important to us i mean i've worked in lots of organizations where we have put uh, systems in place like this it's really good to think about your technical and your leadership competencies as being uh, a separate grouping and that's because as your roles increase and you go into leadership roles it becomes much more about leadership and much more about less about the kind of technical skills 
Uh, and you'll see that you know, if you look in the detail of how we've profiled all these roles, as you get into the bigger leadership roles, the technical competencies go right to the top, but the actual level of technical knowledge can be a much lower level. It can be at awareness and working level. It doesn't need to be an expert. Where the roles just below that, which are the kind of technical roles, you need to have very high level technical skills. Okay, so it's a mix, um, but that's the kind of um, the philosophy behind all of this. The um, behavioral leadership competencies, we try to use civil service competencies that, that existed. Uh, anyone who's familiar with those, they are very bulky and there were bits missing. The word influencing is not used in civil service competencies or resilience. Um, and these were two very, very important skills. So these were developed by this group of project professionals and these were seen as the, the, the 10 most important competencies for a project professional, particularly things like uh, working in ambiguity, uh, culture change for transformational projects, very, very uh, important indeed. Um, again, this is the four levels and we've also shown here the link back to all the APM competencies because we are still uh, uh, promoting to our people to become RPP and uh, chartered professionals through the APM. Uh, that announcement is going to be made today, I believe, around the uh, around chartership. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and anybody who puts uh, effort and work and data into the tool should also be able to see how they can use that to forward uh, those uh, kind of membership levels as well. So, so Merv, are there any questions around the competencies? Yeah, I've got a couple here. Um, if we take two together, so so one is um, from Brian, and it's about Agile, which he sees is mentioned um, multiple times within the document. Is that considered to be a mainstream competency? And the second is, does this align with the SFIA for grading, which I think is skills for information age? Yes, okay, so that, that question is a good one. Now, in, in government, we have other professions also working on their professional competencies and frameworks as well. We are probably further ahead than, than all of the others, but one of those that is very close to us is the digital data and technology profession. And we had lots of discussion with them about Agile and where those Agile roles sat. Um, and it's recognized that you know, we still need, uh, in, in many, most projects have some kind of uh, ICT element to them. And the roles, uh, which are the wholly Agile type roles, so product owner, service manager, delivery manager. and delivery manager, are within their frameworks. Um, and there are some crossover roles like business analysts uh, and where the roles are a crossover we have used the same descriptions for those so that there's complete continuity um, but if in, within our framework we have got agile not as a skill but we've got it as a profiling question and you'll probably see that when Mark shows the ghost tool a bit later on so it's important to us to know who has levels of expertise within uh, agile as a methodology um, but the actual roles themselves uh, are in the uh, DDAT um, uh, um, framework, and they are using Sophia skills, I believe, as part of their framework. Yeah, our, our ones here are aligned more to APM, but they are not completely out with uh, the Sophia framework as well. Does that answer the question, Merv? I think that does, so probably need to move on. Um, we've got some more for later. All right, so I'm going to go on to the last part now, which is development. Um, the very first thing we did was put together some guidance around a personal development planning cycle because we want to encourage our people to have a, a development plan. Uh, this wasn't in place in government before, so just understanding your gaps, investigate your opportunities, hold your career conversation, create your plan, put it into action, review, go around the cycle again, and at each step, we've actually got questions for people to, to think about who can help you when you need to do this, tools which can support you, including the ghost tool, which Mark will demonstrate. And at every step of the way, there is guidance for what the line manager should be doing to support you in your development as well. Okay, so these are the six steps. It doesn't say project delivery in there at all, because we've done this in a way that this could be cut and used 
by any profession across government or, or outside of government as well. The next part I really want to show you is the 70-20-10. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the philosophy of 70-20-10. Uh, it's been around a long time, but it's generally saying that uh, the majority of how we learn is through experience, learning on the job. Um, uh, the 10% is more through the kind of structured education, which is generally you know, what we call the off-the-job learning, uh, e-learning, uh, courses, classroom learning, and then the learning through others, the kind of social part. And uh, it, this is a bit that we really want to, to promote uh, considerably within uh, uh, across government. And uh, within the tool itself, Mark will show you how we're trying to promote that and also monitor the, the use of uh, 70 and 20 as part of people's development plans. Now, the last company I worked for was ZOMV in Austria, and, and they are very kind of straight thinkers, and they use the term on the job, off the job, and near the job. So we, we're also encouraging that use to, to, to try and get that to be part of the vernacular that we use in the organization as well. And I think we've got a bit on continued professional development, which covers a lot of the 20%. But the last part really is the curriculum itself. And rather than give a big spreadsheet with a list of loads of courses, we just wanted a kind of infographic, which gave people an idea about how things built up, the kind of you know, types of courses and programs you could do. And if uh, we've got right up the side here, uh, the, the axis across the bottom is really experience. And we've got awareness, e-learning, a lot of that was developed in-house for uh, government project professionals and non-professionals. Then we've got the kind of professional level programs, the foundation and practitioner courses, everything from prints and MSP, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we get into the leadership programs. So the ones I talked about uh, earlier was the, was the PLP, but we've also got leading as an SRO, we put RPP in there, PDLA is another one that uh, our HMRC colleagues use. And then we've got our, our flagship course, which is our major projects, Leadership Academy. And anyone who is a leader on a GMPP project will be expected to go through that. But also, we are being trying to influence on a much higher level across the organisation. So any of our DGs would have been invited to the orchestrating major projects, OMP. And we're on the second cohort of that at the moment. Now, some of the people attending that, you know, they're all very senior but some have very low experience of projects and some are, are very experienced. Our own Tony Meggs, who's the CEO of IPA, went on the first cohort. So that's why uh, of uh, influencing the overall environment within the government. And at the end here, we're also encouraging people to become associates, members and fellows of, of the APM as well. Um, so really that's the development piece. Uh, Merv, is there any questions on, on that last section on development? Um, I, just a couple of things perhaps we'll put in there. Um, how do you propose to keep this relevant and maintained? That's a very good question. Now, we have put a really key thing for us is sustainability. You know, we, this isn't the first time something like this has, has been done in government. And you know that when it happened last time or the time before that, these things have you know, fallen on uh, uh, you know, rocky ground and have become dormant. We don't want that to happen again. Um, the good thing is that John Manzoni, who came in from, you know, he's, he's a, also came from the oil and gas industry, he has put in functional capability development as a, a core tenant of government now. So all professions, you know, all functions are developing their professions. So commercial, finance, digital, us, and you know, uh, security, right across the, the organization. We have put in really good governance to make sure that this uh, has uh, a kind of lasting value and changes with time as it needs to. So we have a head of profession in every department who are our kind of you know, top line. We have people who run capability teams from every department who get together every uh, couple of months and we talk about changes to this. You know, they are, you know, we, we see ourselves not as the owners, it's not the IPA government uh, capability framework, it's the government capability framework, and we see ourselves as custodian and stewards of this, but we see that together we govern the whole thing, and, and uh, that's how we're making sure that this is sustainable and will change with times as it needs to. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got a lot of other questions. We may have to answer some of those offline, but uh, 
I think we need to give Mark a chance to go through the ghost tour. Yeah. Over to Mark. Thank you very much, Miller. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. I'm just going to switch my screen to take you into our, uh, our online skills tool. I'll just log off. because it... Tony has very nicely described our uh, project delivery capability framework. Uh, so what our ghost government online skills tool does is really brings the framework to life. So it allows individuals to uh, assess themselves against our competencies, uh, signpost them to learning in their existing job roles and also any future future job roles as well. So the PDCF was launched back in May. So that's had a number of months for people to become uh, familiar with the roles, the competencies, general awareness of that. But the actual uh, ghost tool is much more recent. So it's only kind of a few weeks old. And already we've, uh, within the government project delivery profession, we've got about 1,200 users on the, on the system. So I'm just going to uh, log in. And the first thing you can see straight away on the home page is the three main sections that Tony talked about in the uh, PDCF uh, appear very prominent uh, within the, uh, the home page of the ghost tool. So there's the competency section where you uh, do your competency assessment, the development part where you build a development plan and career pathways where you can look at all the different project delivery job roles, the 19 job roles, all the different grades that we developed. There's also a profile section because when we create an account in Ghost, uh, sort of information we have about people is what job role they are, uh, what uh, grade they are, what location they are, and also uh, information around career anchors. Now, for most people in the government project delivery profession, their primary career anchor uh, will be project delivery. But actually, a lot of people have uh, kind of uh, come into uh, the project delivery profession from other professions. So, uh, I mean, a good example when Tony showed you the uh, career profiles, he, uh, he looked at uh, Fiona Spencer, the head of profession and home office, who obviously, apart from her PhD in French, uh, was very much on a policy, policy uh, work in the home office before she came into the project delivery profession. So that's kind of the home screen. So let's have a little look at the tool. So the first bit is around the competencies. So if I click on that, obviously it's just the one uh, competency framework that we've got here for our government project delivery profession. So I'm just going to click on assess and click on all skills. Expand the screen a bit so you can see a bit more. So what you, so what you can see on this screen is the, uh, the 19 technical competencies that Tony mentioned in our competency framework then our 10 leadership behavioural competencies, and then a section around experience, so the type of projects uh, that people might have worked on. This is based around the classification for the government's major projects and programmes uh, categories, and we, we did mention uh, Agile earlier, so we've got Agile here, and then below all the uh, project delivery qualifications which are aligned to our Curriculum, so you'll, straight away you'll see some of the uh, the APM qualifications, and further down there is things like level of APM membership. If you're an associate or a, or a full member or a fellow, example. So this is the kind of summary page of the uh, the skills assessment part of the tool, and what you can see here are the different capability levels. So awareness, working practitioner and expert (AWPE). Uh, as Tony describes uh, from the framework. We've also got a non, a no awareness level. Uh, we thought that was useful to have based on experience of uh, using uh, frameworks uh, in the past, because if you didn't have a non awareness, people who didn't have those skills were either leaving it blank, so it was looking as though the record was incomplete, or actually marking themselves to the next level, which in this case is awareness. Uh, so actually giving a wrong kind of uh, flavor of capability and just a few other things just to share, explain on this particular page you will notice that uh, some of the uh, competencies are in bold and have a little green line box around them so in this particular example I've assigned myself to a governance and reporting manager which is one of our 19 job roles 
at the civil service level grade seven. So the ones in bold, these are actually the core skills for that uh, governance and reporting manager. If you remember when Tony showed you the benefits manager role in the BDCF, uh, a section of those 29 skills were classed as core for that particular role. So these are the ones that are core for this, uh, for this governance and reporting role, both in the uh, technical competencies and below in the leadership behavioural ones. One other thing just to highlight here is you'll notice that uh, most of the competencies got a little tick against them. So uh, that means that an individual has done the assessment, they've gone into the tool and a manager has endorsed that rate and said, yes, in benefits management, you are actually at uh, working, working level. But you'll also see further up against risk and issue management, there is a little pencil. And what that means is the individual has done the assessment, but it's not yet been endorsed by a manager. Just one other thing just to point out on this page, uh, you'll see the why. That means, that means yes, and that just refers to the, uh, the qualifications. So we're only interested to know if people have actually got those qualifications and they can record the various project delivery qualifications they've actually got. Now to actually do your assessment, what you do is you actually click on the uh, relevant uh, competencies. So as I am speaking to uh, an event organised by the Benefits Management Special Interest Group, I will click on the Benefits Management uh, competency. And what you can see here is there's a description of the competency. This is a straight lift from our uh, capability framework, so we've not uh, truncated or added the words. It's completely consistent with the uh, the PDCF, so there's the uh, description there, and then below that there are the different levels of capability that we've talked about. So when an individual is doing their assessments, they will uh, look at the description, look at the different levels, and identify which level they feel they, uh, they fit best against. There's also space at the bottom here just to put uh, any additional information very helpful for the manager when they're doing their endorsement of that particular particular skill. So an individual uh, would just go through each of those uh, those competencies. As I said, uh, people are taking between sort of 20, 20 and 40 minutes actually to do to do that uh, uh, work through each of the uh, competencies. But where the tool is actually interesting, where we're helping to kind of signpost people with their development, and you'll see here, we have a section called learning solutions. So this is identifying some learning, particularly in that kind of 10% kind of off the job uh, type training. So you can see in this instance, I've assessed myself at working level in uh, benefits management. But if I wanted to develop my capability in this skill, I can have a look and see if there's anything at a practitioner level, which is level four. And let's have a look. Uh, there's some uh, suggested learning here, one of which is the uh, APMG, Managing Benefits Practitioner. So if I click on that, that gives me a little bit of information about that course. And if I, there's a link there, and this link actually takes me to uh, civil service learning which is the kind of learning portal for uh, staff in most government departments and by logging in here this actually gives me a lot more information about the APMG managing benefits practitioner course so I can find out a lot more about the course uh, what the aims are what I'll get out of it how much it costs how long it lasts the pre-learning and outcomes so very useful information so you're not having to search through civil service learning, which is not the most user-friendly of uh, sites, so it's often quite difficult to, uh, to find uh, things. But what we've done in our ghost tool is we've uh, put links in to all the, uh, the, all the relevant courses on the civil service learning project delivery uh, curriculum. So that might be a course that I want to have a discussion with my manager about might be something worth worth pursuing so I'm just going to actually save that because that means it will appear in another bit of the tool okay so what I'm going to do now is just uh, go to another part of the tool uh, from the home page and look at the career pathways so 
This outlines all the different project delivery job roles. So as we've already mentioned, there are 19 different job roles at uh, different grades. And I mentioned when you create an account, you assign a job role to an individual. So in the example I'm showing you here, it was a governance and reporting manager. But actually, there might be people on uh, smaller projects who actually do more than one job role. So maybe risk as well as governance and reporting. So I can actually use a tool to have a look at the uh, role profile for the risk manager role and see uh, the different core skills for that particular role. But it's also very useful for thinking about career aspirations, so future roles that you might be interested in doing. So again, because I'm speaking to the benefits management SIG, let's for example say I'm interested in maybe a future career as a benefits manager. So I see the top role here is a benefits manager at uh, the grade six level, which is the level above the, uh, the role that uh, I'm currently doing. So if I click on this, this gives me the role profile for the benefits manager. What you can see here on the left hand side are the core skills for that benefits manager role. And you can see by the little green line box, this is the required level of capability against those particular competencies. But the really interesting bit is the, uh, the shading, because the shading actually shows my current level of capability. So I can, this is helping me identify the areas that I need to develop my skills further in. So some areas where quite a bit of work to do, for example, my business case developments, but then there's other areas where I'm actually uh, at the level I need to be, so budgeting, cost management, and then some like governance, uh, where I'm actually well, well above uh, the level I need to be. So it's kind of providing you with uh, some suggestions uh, of areas to focus your capability development on. And what you can do actually is uh, if you click on the, uh, the relevant skill, there's this area called show learning solutions and you can see what there is. Now one thing that's uh, very prominent is, and we've mentioned it, is around this concept of 70-20-10 learning. So really encouraging people as part of their sort of learning to think about kind of on the job and near the job learning. So a good example uh, in this case might be if I'm interested in uh, becoming a benefits manager in the 20% area might be to actually shadow a benefits manager, learn, learn from what they're doing. So there's always kind of a prompt for 70 and 20 learning. But if I scroll down further, there is uh, some uh, suggested learning as well. So things that's like the better business cases, practitioner course, uh, managing successful programs, etc. So again, here there are Kind of details of these courses and links again to uh, the learning portal. So the tool is kind of very useful for kind of future career kind of aspirations. The final bit on the tool I want to show you is around the development. So this is actually building a development plan that will help you in current either current or future roles. So I click on here and what you can do is you can uh, set uh, specific skill objectives against our 29, 29 competencies. If I just click on set skill objectives, it identifies from my actual skills assessment, there's two areas for development, uh, one around collaboration and another around influencing. And the influencing, I've done a worked example that I'll talk through in a second. But also, you can do it against your strength areas as well if you want to further develop your capability in that area. So I've just created an example. It's a very rough and ready example. Uh, uh, so around promoting the ghost tool. So if I just click on show details, and what you can see is the example I'm doing is presenting this uh, demonstration at the APM webinar today. And success measures, you can add lots in and uh, obviously Ideally, they should be uh, smart, worded, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and timely, but just for the purpose of this demo, I just did a kind of very quick, quick exercise. But where it is very useful is you can actually uh, allocate uh, different types of learning. 
So you can see here we've got uh, some categories of the 70 and 20 learning that I've assigned to that particular example. So what, how you do that is just add learning. And first of all, it's identifying if there's anything in the 10% area that I might be interested in. But if I'm interested in sort of uh, 70 or 20 learning, if I just click on find learning and just type in 70, it brings up the categories of uh, uh, on the job training. If I type in 20, it brings up the different categories of, uh, of uh, nearly job training. So things like coaching and mentoring and slight small, uh, short descriptions. Again, like the PDCF, I've tried to keep the language kind of very clear and simple. And you can add the relevant ones onto your particular objective. So that's, again, specific competencies. You can also do a development goal which is kind of wider, wider, maybe spans a number of objectives. So I've done one around obtaining a registered project professional status by the end of March 2019. But again, it's the exact same process, allocating uh, different, uh, different categories of learning to that. So it provides you with a kind of learning plan. And you remember earlier, uh, we talked about the Managing Benefits course. So it's picked that up, and when I've had that discussion with my manager that this is something worth pursuing, they can then approve that, and this is captured within your learning plan. And there's also a timeline as you uh, do your various activities. And as things get completed, they are highlighted in this development record. So if I click on here, so I've already got some completed ones. Again, another one around sort of buy-in for the tool, around the influencing. And this was actually uh, presenting a demonstration of this tool to John Manzoni, who is the, uh, the chief executive of the uh, civil service and the permanent secretary in the cabinet office, who, is, uh, who really likes both our PDCF and uh, our uh, online skills tool. And it's a bit of a luxury today. We've got an hour to talk about it. Uh, Tony and I had seven minutes each to uh, demo the PDCF and the online skills tool. Uh, so this is real, uh, <laughs> real luxury today. So an individual is putting lots of information into the system about their, uh, their current skills, what learning they're doing. So one of the nice things about uh, the Ghost tool is it can produce a individual development plan. So this is something that uh, people can uh, print off, uh, download, and take into conversations they are having with their managers around their capability, developments, uh, future career plans. So if I just click on here, and there's no blue Peter, here's one I made earlier. So I'm just gonna click on export to PDF. And what this brings up is a development plan. So at the touch of a button, so it gives information about the job profile you're doing. It's got all your various uh, skill assessment information, breakdown of your skills. It's got your areas of strength are highlighted here on this uh, particular page that I've got. The next section is around areas for development. So you'll remember there's two areas that uh, were identified for myself around influencing and collaboration. So it's picking these up. It's also suggesting some learning in the kind of 10% area. And then the really nice bit is around uh, this kind of breakdown of learning to, to 70, 20, 10 as well, which is uh, very useful because obviously it's something we are trying to encourage within the government project delivery profession is this concept of uh, most of your learning is actually done on the job or near the job. So it's actually today, this webinar is a good example of the 20% uh, near the job uh, training. So there's a lot that the individual can get out of using the uh, GOES tool uh, to help them uh, kind of manage their careers, but also kind of uh, organisationally and sort of government level that provide a wealth of kind of uh, information. Uh, to individuals. Uh, so we'll be able to know where our strengths are, where our gaps are. We know who our experts are, who will help maybe facilitate events, uh, sessions, so not just within departments, but uh, sort of geographically as well. So there's a whole range of uh, uses that the data will really help with our developing our profession and, and 
continuing to improve the way that uh, governments deliver projects. Yeah. I'm very conscious we uh, seem to be kind of sort of overrunning, so I will end there. So I hope that's really kind of brought the, uh, the PDCF to life just with a very quick demonstration of the ghost tool. So Merv, I will hand back to you. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much uh, for that, Mark, and uh, and thanks, Tony, for what you provided. As you say, we're out of time, so I've got about 20 questions here. Um, quite a lot are uh, from the private sector as to how they can access Ghost and the PDCF. So um, there's one for you guys to think about. Looks like there's quite a lot of demand there. And um, I'll get you to, again, treat these as kind of FAQs and we'll publish those. Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, it looks like a, a good number of you are interested in the GovPDC online community. So, so that's great. Thanks for completing the survey. Um, those are our two speakers. Um, thanks ever so much to you guys. Um, and here you will see, again, at the end of uh, the where you of Mentimeter, uh, a number of useful links. These will be included in uh, the information that we send out a little bit later, but that's where you can find out about the PDCF. Um, and I've written a LinkedIn article about it. Um, the joining the Gov PDC network. We've got another webinar coming up on the 18th of December. And as I said, this is uh, represents the culmination of our current campaign. You can find information about it there. Join our SIG via the website so thanks once again everyone uh, thank you to our speakers and we'll finish up there